Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. So, to the class, uh, welcome back, welcome to Monday. And we are joined today by Thomas Burrell, the author of the book for this class, Brainwashed. Uh, Mr. Burrell is a huge name in the advertising industry. He was raised in Chicago, attended uh, Roosevelt College, and majored in English. And in 1971, uh, started his own advertising firm, which has come, which has since evolved into one of the premier advertising firms uh, for, or more importantly, aware of black issues in American media and international media. Uh, he has been awarded a wide variety of amazing uh, honors, including the Albert Lasker Award for Lifetime Achievement and the prestigious Missouri Honor Medal for Distinguished Service in Journalism. So uh, can we please give him a round of applause and thank him for coming today? Despite uh, all technological failures that brought us to this point. So uh, we have about 35 students in the class, or no, we have about 25, 28 students in the class. Uh, they come from a wide variety of industries. At Newhouse, you can't major in theory, even though that's what I teach. You can't major in theory. You have to major in an applied field. So okay. the unique uh, intersection of this class for me is really trying to apply theory to um, to industry practice. And so I'm incredibly enamored with your book, primarily because it does just that. Um, oh, thank you. Absolutely. It takes the history and the knowledge and applies it to what's happening in uh, the current media environment, and more importantly, then giving instructions for future media practitioners to uh, deploy theoretical concepts and improve media content as a whole. Great, thank you. Absolutely. So, um, well, thank you for having me, and thank, thank you, and thank, 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 I want to thank the class for uh, for reading the book and, uh, and for whatever questions and issues you want to raise. I, I welcome that. Absolutely. So, I will we'll turn the camera back and forth, but I will definitely turn it back so you can see the students as we get to those questions. Um, okay. But. First of all, I would really like to talk, I would really like you to introduce yourself by talking a little bit about what you've done in the industry, how you got to here, and what inspired you to start your own advertising firm. Okay, well let's let's start. Uh, I'm going to try to make it, uh, a quick time uh, thing, going all the way back to uh, uh, age 16 when I was uh, a high school student. And I was a fairly aimless uh, high school student, uh, basically trying to, to, to stay in high school <laughs> because uh, I had had some difficulties uh, prior to that. But anyway, I, uh, as part of my tr attempt to get my life together, I took a, a, a class called Careers. I don't know if that still exists, but... It's a class for students who are looking for direction as to which way they may go uh, in their lives uh, professionally. So part of that class uh, consisted of uh, an aptitude test. And so I took this aptitude test, and not surprisingly, I didn't do well in a lot of areas scientific, mathematical, uh, so forth. But there were two areas where I did do well. One was called uh, artistic, and one area was called persuasive. And I went to my uh, teacher and asked her what that meant. And it took her about 30 seconds to say, well, what it means is that you might want to consider being an advertising copywriter. And uh, I don't know about you, but back then in high school, I had no idea what that was. So, so I asked her, what did that mean? And she told me that it was someone who basically uses persuasive skills and artistic skills to, to get people to, to buy products and, and services and basically writing ads. And so that sounds pretty cool to me. So uh, I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. So I went straight into the, to, the, uh, to the cafeteria where I 
met my new friends and told them I was going to be an advertising copywriter. And that surprisingly, they also said, well, what is that? And, uh, and then I told them, and all of a sudden I'm holding sway at, 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 the, uh, at the lunch table. And then I decided, I'd say, I said, well, I better get out here and, and learn something about it. And, and that's what I did. And I became in, intrigued with the, uh, the psychology of selling. I read a book called The Hidden, per, Hidden Persuaders, a book that was uh, just out by a guy named Vance Packard, where he kind of exposed uh, all this whole thing about subliminal uh, persuasion and advertising. So I read that book and it, I, I took psychology courses and writing courses and wound up uh, graduating and going to Roosevelt University and majoring, well, first I majored in psychology with a minor in advertising, but uh, I quickly ran into uh, an obstacle as a psychology major, and that obstacle was called statistics. <laughs> and you may, you may recall that I didn't do well in math on that, that aptitude test, so uh, I uh, quickly uh, switched my major to English. Um, but at the same time that I was doing that, I was also taking advertising courses and also uh, basically running my mouth and, and, and telling the whole world that I was going to be an advertising copywriter. And of course, at that time, there were no African Americans or, or as we Negroes, as we were called then, in the advertising agency business in any form in the city of Chicago, and only faintly in the, in the city of New York, which is the capital of advertising agencies. So uh, I think people basically took it with a grain of salt, but I kept talking about it. And I kept majoring in it, and I kept uh, looking at ways to uh, practice uh, the trade. Because one of the wonderful things about being an advertising copywriter is all you have to do basically is, is to have a uh, piece of paper and a writing instrument and access to media. So I would look at media and I would rewrite advertising, rewrite ads. And, uh, and so uh, what happened is that in my senior year at Roosevelt, I got wind of an opportunity to work in the mailroom of a, the third largest agency in Chicago. The name of the agency was Wade Advertising. And they were looking to hire a Negro for the, uh, to work in the mailroom with the idea that they may be able to move that person forward in years to come. So I applied for that job. And since uh, there, there weren't any other uh, candidates, uh, for that job, uh, how unusual it was for, for a young black kid to take a careers course and, and take an aptitude test and, and score high in persuasive and artistic and have a teacher to tell you exactly what you should do and then to have a student who said, okay, I'll do it. Uh, so there were no other candidates. And so I got the job and that was the beginning of my advertising career. Uh, so I then began my campaign, my persuasive campaign, to get out of the mailroom. And uh, the technique I used uh, to do that was simply to act like what I was trying to become. So as I wandered around the agency uh, delivering mail and went up to the mailroom collating um, memos, and uh, changing the towels in the towel machine in the men's washroom and the coats in the coat machines. Uh, I always made sure that I want that I looked out of place in that job. That I looked as though I want I should be in the uh, in an office somewhere doing important work. I looked important. I dressed like an advertising executive. I I, I walked and talked like one. And I begged the question, what is that guy doing pushing that mail cart around? And one day, I pushed the mail cart around to uh, the office of the creative director who was uh, alone. So I walked into the office, and I sat down in that office, and I said, uh, 
uh, you may know who I am. You see me around pushing, you know, the mail cart and delivering mail. But I want to tell you that I have, uh, I have, uh, on pretty good authority, that is the memos that I have been able to uh, collate and, and, and copy, uh, extra copy for myself. That you, you got some issues. You got some problems uh, with uh, Alka Seltzer, one of the one of the one of the products, one of the clients. And I, uh, I I went on to talk about what I felt about the uh, problem and the, some of the solutions that I had for the problem. And then I went on to say that, uh, or basically to ask the question, does it make any sense for me to be pushing this mail cart around when I could be sitting in an office behind a desk helping you solve your problems? <laughs> Uh, needless to say, two two uh, two weeks later, I was uh, I was doing just that. I was a junior copywriter in the business, and I did that work for the next three and a half years, working for that agency. Before I got, uh, I, I was recruited by Leo Burnett, which many of you may know, is one of the largest agencies, certainly the largest agency in Chicago, and one of the largest in the world. And I worked there for three and a half years before going off to uh, Europe uh, to work for uh, Foot Conan Belding. Uh, I lived in Paris and, I, and then I worked in London. And then I came back and I worked for Needham, Harper and Steers, now called DDB Needham. I, I did that for uh, three and a half years. And, and during that time that I started to form this whole notion of, of starting, my own, starting my own company. And that, you know, a lot has to do with being born at the right time and being born in the right place because it just so happened that at the time that I was starting to, to gain experience in the advertising agency business and think about being out on my own in an entrepreneurial way, um, uh, we were at the, at the beginning uh, or the middle of the beginning of the civil rights movement, not so much the civil rights movement of Martin Luther King, but the civil rights movement of Stokely Carmichael, who in the uh, in 1966, during a march in Mississippi, the Meredith March in Mississippi, led by Martin Luther King, uh, Stokely Carmichael yelled out the term "Black Power," and and that was seminal because. For the first time, the whole notion of black equality was not tied to integration in, in a cultural sense. The, the premise of, of black power was that it, you can be equal and different. You don't have to be the same to be equal. The implication that integration in the in the civil rights set kind of suggested black people integrating into uh, white culture or black people integrating into white life. Uh, that would black power was about black identity, and it rejected that notion. And it was that very basic notion that was the bedrock for an advertising agency focusing on the African-American market. Because if indeed black people were the same essentially as white people, there would be no need for a special effort because the effort was based on the uniqueness of black people. I coined the phrase, black people are not dark-skinned white people, to highlight that whole notion that you don't have to be like white people to be equal to white people. And so that was the beginning of my mission and the beginning of the business that focused on selling products to the African-American consumer based on the uniqueness of the black consumer. And that's where we started, and that's where we went over a period of years, and that's what led eventually to uh, the success of the agency, and through the career at the agency, led me after the agency to start thinking about 
uh, how the, the deeper deeper meaning of this whole idea of what makes black people tick. And I started to look at those kinds of, 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 of issues and led to the, the writing of the, of the book. Thank you for such an amazing history. I hope it uh, provides a lot of context for the students that may only be uh, working with the text. Uh, I really appreciate your comments about, or you know, the quote I have it actually written in my notes, that uh, black people are not dark-skinned white people. Um, this week, we're actually discussing Latinos and assimilation and the expectation of assimilation in uh, the U.S. So I think that that's a really interesting point to discuss within this context. Mm -hmm. I would love for you to talk a little bit about some of the challenges you faced um, in not only starting your own company, but even further upstream that actually advocating for or that there was a black audience. Um, one of the assignments, and I believe we talked about this before, one of the assignments I asked the students to do is to apply the theories to some current media context to understand why it's problematic or why it's beneficial. Why should we have an interracial couple in the Cheerios commercial? And why is that a good thing moving forward? Uh, and we talk, and I ask them to practice engaging with these, this pushback. So I would really love for you to talk a little bit about some of the pushback you got in advocating for black audiences and attempting to change the script. Okay, well, from a historical perspective, uh, I think it's, it's, it's fair to, to point out that race is one of the most thought about, at least on some level of consciousness, one of the most thought about or felt about issues and one of the least talked about. Certainly that was true back uh, prior to the civil rights uh, movement. So the, the, the thing that is very difficult for people to deal with is race. They do not... Every, on both sides, there seems to be a, a, a yearning to put race behind us. But that yearning is wishful thinking without the work, without the work of healing the, uh, the scars that, ha that have occurred over the, the generations. So what's happening now? Uh, if I am addressing your question correctly, is that there is a move towards putting race behind us. It's generally called post-racial, post-racial. Uh, and the whole notion of post-racialism is that the problem is solved and, and it's over with. And I, I take issue with that uh, because I live in primarily in a world of, of Blackness, where I see the differences and I see the unhealed uh, wounds taking place, despite the the kind of illusion of overall progress, when that progress is basically uh, what I call the acceptable exceptions. Uh, can you elaborate on the concept of the acceptable exceptions? Uh, the the concept of the acceptable exception is that the 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 power elite, the people who are, have a vested interest in keeping the status quo, are willing to put up examples of people of color making progress. Mm -hmm. And essentially that is to shield the lack of progress. So a good example, if I make, if I make an African American the head of an institution or an organization that discriminates against black people generally and and that organization then is, is buying itself protection against attack for discriminating against black people because they will say, well, I can't, you can't accuse me of that because I have a black CEO, a black chief executive officer or a black person in charge. And that's basically what is going on uh, now, the acceptable exception. And, and, and it, it comes from this whole idea of, of, of these people who are exceptional being said, hey, you're not like the rest of them. Yeah, the, um, the catchphrase I like to use is black and brown faces in high places. 
-hmm. that it yeah. gives the illusion of diversity yeah. without actually changing the system, the systemic problems. Right. Yeah, I call that the paradox of progress. Uh, I, I, I refer to that in the book. Absolutely. Um, but what I was asking specifically is, could you talk about some of the challenges that you faced in developing your agency? Maybe share a story where you came into, I won't say conflict, but discussion with someone that was pushing back. And just an example of how you were able to cope with those challenges in a predominantly uh, homogenous workplace. Well, the there, there, was, there, was, there were several uh, instances. Uh, I'll give you one, uh, one story. Mm -hmm. um, there was pushback from a major client of ours saying that if we, if they advertise to black people in an in a open public kind of way, it would lose them white customers. And so we lost opportunities there until I came to them and I said, look, I will make you a deal. Allow us to do a television commercial uh, featuring black people, put it on network television where lots of white people are watching, and I will assure you that not only will that product not turn off, not only will that, that uh, advertising uh, help you with the black consumer market, but it will not turn off the white consumer. So I, I sold in that concept, and we did the commercials for Coca-Cola. Not only did it turn on the, what, uh, the black consumer who had never seen themselves projected so positively before, it also not only did not turn off the white consumer, but it actually, the, the commercial that we did featuring black people did better among whites than the commercials that were designed to reach white people. So th their white commercials were not as effective at reaching white people as the black commercial was at reaching white people. Not only that, the commercial ran uh, uh, internationally. And so that was one obstacle that we faced uh, and had to uh, overcome. There were people. There was. There were. There were times when clients did not want to uh, uh, let their uh, constituencies know, like bottlers or dealers, that they had a black agency. So we had to basically sometimes hide uh, within the system. In one case, uh, the marketing people did not even allow the let the uh, chief executive know that we were there uh, because of fear of, of reprisal, fear, fear of that they would they, they would be punished for hiring us. So we had any number of, of, of issues. Uh, there were times when we did work and the general market agency was given credit for it because they couldn't uh, say that uh, you know we 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 did it. But the general argument was that we did not need a black agency because we didn't need a black effort and we didn't need a black effort because white people and black people were just alike and therefore did not require any separate effort and that was you know across the board for the first four or five years of our existence that's the best about we had to use. Um, so on that note can you share what uh your, I don't want to say biggest problem, but the most glaring issue that you're seeing in the advertising industry or the media industry in general today, uh, maybe with or considering digital uh, media content. When we talked, you said a little bit about concept versus execution. I would really like for you mm -hmm. to elaborate on that for the students, please. Well, well, the, the biggest problem we face uh, t today is the, the preponderance of uh, a prevailing, uh, the prevailing belief that there's no longer a need for a special black effort simply because black people no longer uh, have an issue and that black people are indeed dark-skinned white people. Uh, and we see that being played out uh, across the board in both uh, conventional advertising and in uh, the new the new advertising the, the new the advertising brought about by the, the new technology where uh, it's generally 
being uh, touted that black people and white people are no longer distinctive from one another. There is a kind of a melting pot uh, uh, theory uh, that, uh, that exists there. So uh, with regards to concept versus, versus strategy, uh, versus execution, we have such a torrent of bombardment of messaging going on nowadays in, in, the, in the, the older, in the days, private uh, advertising uh, periods, that the whole con concept-driven message was, was the thing. But since there are so many, many messages, concept in and of itself does not cut it anymore because you've got to do something to cut through all of the clutter. And so now we are resorting more to executional tricks and techniques to get attention uh, and sometimes uh, concept gets lost. The idea, the selling idea gets left behind because the, the, the major motive is just to get the name out there and get and be remembered. So that's that's where we are now. Two things happening, post-racialism and, and more towards execution and concept. Uh, so we've been talking for about 30 minutes. I want to open it up to the students. I mean, I have lots of other questions, but uh, I would like to open it up to the students who may have a question for you so that we can field some of that. Does anybody have a question? Because otherwise I'm going to ask the questions that you posted online. And I would really love for uh, you guys to ask your own questions. No? Anybody? All right. Uh, well, then we'll start off with Marisa Stark's question. And Marisa will raise her hand so you can see where she is. That's Mar I, I, There we go. That's Marisa. Hi, Marisa. How are you doing? Marisa asked, uh, what can we as students, but not big media producers, but small content creators, so this kind of gets at um, both digital and industry, what can we as students, uh, not even big media producers, but small content creators, do to help remold society? Well, what you can, what you can do is keep in mind, here, here's something that you can put on your wall. All media messaging is propaganda. And what that is essentially saying is that there is nothing more powerful to shape attitudes and thinking than media messaging. It is historically and still is the most powerful force for affecting change. So as you go about the business, of creating messages, ask yourself the question, is this execution, is this concept moving us forward or moving us back? Now, it may be creative, it may be interesting, it may even be the truth, but the real question is, does this help to move society forward or to move us back? All the, all the time, Excuse me. <laughs> Hello. Hello. So sorry. No worries. Um, all the time that we were selling McDonald's to the black and silver market, you go back and you look through the history. <laughs> um, look through the history. We portrayed African Americans in a positive and realistic setting. We used every opportunity to make positive declarative uh, statements about black culture. So when you're, when you're putting together messages, keep that in mind. 
to make sure that you're putting out a positive, putting it in a positive context, and uh, and that remember that all, as a matter of fact, all art is propaganda, and propaganda is just a is just another way of saying media message. Right. Um, I thank you, thank you for that amazing elaboration. Um, I get I. So I make a big stink about issues of visibility versus representation, right? So that we can be extremely visible but have no representation, no right. addressing of issues, uh, even though, you know, black, for, black folks are on the top, uh, top 40 countdown. Right. And um, there's a question from Chelsea, who you have in your FaceTime. Uh, yes. Because she's very sweet, so there she is over there. Hi, Chelsea. Yeah. Thank, thank, thanks for trying. <laughs> Um, so Chelsea asks about uh, your reference to the black bottom line, and her question is, how can representation of black success in media actively combat the black bottom line? Hmm. Let me, let me understand that. Uh, do that again. Yeah, not a problem. In fact, I asked her to elaborate her questions in detail, and, she, and I'll, so I'll just read the entire segment to you. It took me a while, this is me as Chelsea now, it took me a while to figure out exactly what this phrase meant, the black bottom line, to come to the realization that no matter how successful black folk become, the bottom line is that African Americans are con constantly subjected to content that enforces the stereotypes of black inferiority. While, while it is hurtful to believe that no matter how successful a black person becomes, they will still be made to feel inferior, inferior I believe that media is a way to raise morale. So in your opinion, how can representation of black success in the media actively combat the continuous subjection of black individuals to yes. stereotypes, slurs, etc.? Well, well, what you do is understand the power that simply combating the bombardment of negative images with a counter-bombardment of positive images can help to neutralize and hopefully at some point decimate the negative images. So it's a real simple matter. It's hard to do, but it's, it, it's, it's simple in concept to basically overcome the, the, the bombardment of negative images with positive images whenever you possibly have an opportunity uh, to do that, and that's all you basically have to do. I, you know, I, I stand behind the notion that images are extremely powerful, and and and, and portraying positive positive images uh, uh, that, that in itself is is a powerful tool. You don't have to you don't have to do a whole lot of preaching. You know, basically, if you get the right kind of uh, uh, frontal and subliminal messages about a uh, uh, group of people that could say something positive and very subtly through any kind of sensory perception, then you're doing your job. Okay, uh, we have another question in the back. Uh, Kara, I'm actually going to invite you to come up so that you can, uh, you can bring your paper if you like, just so that you can ask the question and I don't have to repeat it. Or... Do you want to say, well, go ahead, come on in. I'll get a Price is Right set up for next time. <laughs> yeah, come on down. Yeah. Oh, come on, audio. Go ahead. Oh. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the BI complex you talked about and how um, you said it was a competitor's product, uh, product and just yes. about how you were saying that, like, stable... Black families are considered the exception and not the norm in the world. Okay. <laughs> Hello? Hi. Awesome. It's working better now. Apparently FaceTime okay, well. has a 30-minute window. So. Um, okay. okay. So let's go back to Kara's question. I'll turn you around. Uh, specifically elaborating on the black inferiority complex, and then what was the second part of your question again? Um, it was just a post question about why are stable, normal black families the exception. Oh, yes. Why are stable, fam stable black families the exception? Um, well, okay. Um, 
first, 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 first of all, first of all um, the, the BI complex is this, the, the, the internalization of the, the, the of this, the, the myth of black inferiority that, as you read in the book, has been has, has been uh, hemp, we've been bombarded with since the beginning of this country, and it was a tool that was used to justify the irreconcilable uh, uh, contradiction of between, between slavery and democracy. Okay, so that's where the campaign, the BI campaign began. It, 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 it is in the best interest of the people who are in control to keep that concept going to justify what was done to African Americans. So we see that being played out in the continual projection of these negative images of African Americans. Now, with regards to the black family and how the stable black family has overcome that, I would not necessarily say that that always happens. Because as I said, as I said earlier, there's nothing more powerful than, than media messaging, and very often media messaging can even trump stable households. In the cases where stable households do trump uh, media messaging, it's simply because of the force of, 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 of the uh, indoctrination from the family to override this constant bombardment. It, it, I have to say that very often it is not that successful if you're talking about on a deep psychological level how we as black people really feel about ourselves. There's a lot of work being done at, at the university level, especially with the advent of neuroscience that tell us that we still, even though we walk around as if we have overcome this, this, this BI complex, that if you do the probing, you will find that we are still carrying around a, a lot of that despite having come from stable families. So uh, I would not be so quick to say that, oh, that person came from a stable family, therefore they have not been touched by this, uh, this campaign. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. I'm going to invite Alfred to come down, but also I have a great one that I'd really love for you to extend on in this uh, thread is from Kwamea in the back. There she is. If you can see her. There you go. Kwamea asks, uh, considering the historical context for the term, uh, for which the term black leaders came about, do you believe an alternative designation should be given to those who would be considered modern black leaders? So as we're in this uh, thread of the black family and um, changing the images of black folks, can you talk a little bit about uh, your perceptions of new black leaders uh, and if that phrase is outdated or uh, what you think the role of um, important individuals within the black community should be? I, I, I think, uh, Angie, can you get that? Um, I think that there is an over-reliance on uh, monolithic black leadership. I think one of the problems that, uh, that we have, and one of the things that I touched on in the book, is this whole concept of learned helplessness. And the external, what I call the external locus of control. That, it, what that simply means that we as individuals are looking outside of ourselves externally for help and for, for direction and guidance instead of looking internally within ourselves for what we are fully capable of. So I, unfortunately, the term leadership in our community often, to, often means somebody telling us what we ought to do. And what I contend is that we need to be looking more inside to what we are capable of, of doing in terms of thought processes, decision making, critical thinking, learning, uh, to, to, 
In other words, we should be leaders of ourselves, and that can morph into leadership of other people who need it to some degree. But what we ought to be teaching people is not how to follow, but how to think. And everyone should question everything that is, 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 uh, is told to them. That doesn't mean you don't accept it, but you accept it after thinking about the, the, the wisdom, the truth, the veracity of what you've been told. So uh, I think that if anything needs to be redefined, it, it needs to be that black, maybe black guidance, black consulting, uh, some other word perhaps needs to be, be used. But right now we're talking about a, a nation of sheep, whether you're talking about black or white people, we, are, we, we basically are not learning to think independently and deductively or, or logically. Okay, so uh, we're going to switch to Alfred. I'm going to invite Alfred to come up. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Alfred. Hey, Alfred. Hey, how are you? Um, I'm just going back to your note about what you were talking about earlier about how, you know, positive imagery is very important and, you know, how all media is, tech is pretty much propaganda and how we should try to bombard the media with a lot of positive imagery to change, like, I guess, ideas and things like that, which I think right. is relatively easy in advertising or in public relations compared to, you know, being done in newspapers where there's always a trend of if it bleeds, it leads. So I think... Uh, what I'm trying to figure out is how how can we make positive positive imagery, you know, something that's newsworthy or like that gets more coverage in you know journalism. Yeah, uh, in in, ger in in ger in journalism generally, we do have that problem yeah. of news by its very nature being negative, meaning negative. Somebody gets killed. Somebody robs you know robs a, a store. Uh, and that is a, a major challenge, and that has to do with what people have been trained to look at as as interesting or intriguing. What we have to what we have to do again is counter that, even in the most difficult circumstances, with positive uh, stories. And part part of part of that is is making that story interesting enough, uh, creative enough to, to be, to be of, of, of value to the consumer. Uh, you know, I, I use that example sometimes in music when you take all of the elements that make up a popular hip-hop song and you, and you look at the variables of, of rhythm and, the, and, and and melody and uh, uh, chord structure and so forth. And you say, well, if I could just use all those elements, but then put in some positive information within those elements, then those, those things that are cool can, can carry that message. You know, there's no reason that I can think of that within the, the the, uh, uh, of all these variables, you can't put in a positive message about someone doing well in school, right? And that, and that perhaps the idea that being smart is, is, is really cool, really hip. Um, in, in, a, in a newspaper article, when somebody commits a crime, there's also somebody who comes in and helps and saves somebody who rescues someone, who does something heroic. Let that make, romanticize that and make that cool. Uh, so that's the kind of work that, that you as young communicators need to be engaged in. How, how do you, how do you, first of all, you have to understand that the, that these images, when the images are negative, because that go, that goes right by most of us. Um, thank you. I would actually like to expand this discussion a little bit because one of the things that I ask the students to think about is how your posit positive propaganda notes apply to other groups. 
right? So that we, what we can take from what we learned uh, with the long history of the black community in the U.S. and apply it to other groups as well. Um, and I was actually really impressed with Lucas's question. There's Lucas Lamble, you know, wave there, there we go. Um, and he, um, I guess I'll just read the whole thing. Uh, you discussed at the beginning of chapter nine, people who recognize the power of the inside force are more likely to be confident and proceed through outside influence to succeed in life. He was actually quite uh, taken with your theories about the wait for God message, your discussion about the wait for God message in the black church, and how that also replicates within the Catholic church. So sort yeah. of internalized guilt. Uh, the question is explicitly how, I am curious, Luke is curious, uh, how the two notions of Catholic guilt and the black church's wait for God messages can be compared and contrasted. Well, that's interesting because in some ways uh, they are very much comparable. Uh, you know, wait on, you know, guilt was the, the very basis for the, uh, the, the whole justification for, ex for blacks' acceptance of slavery to the extent that it was. And that is, wait for your reward uh, in, in heaven, you, you know, uh, be a servant now so that you can get your reward uh, in, in heaven. And the curse of Ham, which that came up, was a big part of the propaganda that was put on black people, had to do with guilt. You know, the curse of Ham uh, was basically uh, transferred very magically, because it has nothing to do with anything about race, uh, to... Uh, to black people feeling guilty and feeling uh, uh, like they deserve their their lot. I, I think that it, it, to the extent that I understand what's going on in in the uh, in the Catholic uh, Church, uh, there is this whole sense of uh, we, you start off with the idea that you're sinners, that you did something wrong. So. That's, that's, a, that's a big hole that you get climb up from, from the get-go, you know, and you spend your whole life uh, uh, kind of apologizing. I'm reminded of, uh, to some degree of this recent incident that took place right outside of Chicago where the, where the cop asked the guy, and this is all on tape, by the way, if you didn't, you didn't see it, cop asked the guy, he, he stopped for a seatbelt violation, he, he asked him to get his license. He, he, he reaches into his car to get his license. He, he shoots him. He shoots the guy as he's getting into the car doing what the police asked him to do. And then he shoots him three more times. And then he's falling back, having been shot. He's forced to put his arms behind his back so he get handcuffed. And he's asking the police, what did I do? What did I do? I, I, and the cop said, you did something wrong. And, and the guy who's been shot four times, he says, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry. And that was a, a, a modern day example of how we get brainwashed to believe that it's our fault. To some degree, there is a correlation uh, there. And if I knew, uh, understood a little bit more about, about the, the Catholic religion, I may be able to, to, to expound on it more, but that's, that's what I see on the surface. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Maya, who's going to come down. Do you? Is that Maya? This is Maya. Um, so, I guess in the black community, there seems to be, I guess, a proliferation of black-on-black -black crime. Um, and it's kind of seen to be the norm, but um, when there's a lot of complaints about it, it's almost as if we're preaching to the choir. Um, everybody who, I guess knows about black on black crime or they they already heard the message over and over it's the same people at every protest and every event um so my question is how do we spread the message to the dominant consumer who doesn't necessarily know that there's a problem how do we make those changes the dominant consumer um i'm not so sure that that's our our our, our mission maya uh, I think that the, 
we are the dominant consumer. The dominant consumer uh, is those of us who consume the violence. And whether we voluntary or involuntary, we are the consumers of violence. And it's basically what we think of ourselves that needs to be be addressed. If I if I hear your question right about the dominant consumer, um, so we need to understand how we have been had, how we have been how we have been tricked into disrespecting, mistrusting, and and disliking ourselves, and to be understood that when we are shooting other people like us, we're, it, it's, it's, it's self-destructive. We're, we're actually shooting our, our, ourselves. We've been taught to hate ourselves, and therefore anything that looks like us, we've been taught uh, to, to hate. And so um, I think that for our first job is to work on our ourselves. I think it's unfortunate that we do create this image out here in the, in the broader society that we uh, uh, that we kill each other. I mean, I, we, we've seen the, the white right wingers use that a lot. You know, you're talking about you're talking about crime. Why don't you stop committing crime against each other and and, and leave leave us alone? There is a connection there. The unfortunate connection is that we have bought into the myth of black inferiority, and that gets reinforced every time a white cop kills a black kid. That makes the message, it makes the, it sends the message, reinforces the message that a black life is not worth very much. If the black life is not very much worth very much, then let's go out and kill each other some more. So it's 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 a it's a form if you will, of insanity. And it's, it, sh it should be reasonable to expect that untreated trauma over a period of years would lead to insanity. And we've got to, we've got to treat that at the base level, at a root level, in order to solve it, not at a topical level. I also think it's uh, really valuable given the uh, crime or the myth of black on black crime. I believe the statistics were something like 85% of crimes against black folks are perpetuated by other black folks. Having said that, it's the same percentage in the white community. So 85% of crimes against whites have been, perpet have been uh, perpetrated by other whites. Um, but nonetheless, we only have half the conversation happening, right? Black on black crime is the constant repeated phrase whereas we don't hear about white on white crime. Yeah, but 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 my but my my response to that is that it doesn't really matter what white people do, we are the ones who are in the deepest hole and we've got to be better than that. I mean, we can't use white on white crime as a barometer of what we should be doing. We should be we should be loving ourselves. And uphold, you know, and, and uniting and nurturing each other because we are working from the deficit. If you will, white people have the luxury of going out and killing themselves. They are already ahead of the game. They can do what they want to do. They can. We we have uh, we had Walinda on the weekend uh, walking the tightrope across uh, the Chicago River. You know. He, he can afford to do that. We can afford to. They can afford to lose another worthwhile white guy. He, you know, they, they they climb mountains and they they, they fly uh, spacecraft. Uh, I mean, they they get in game uh, in, in barroom brawls. Uh, we have got to focus on ourselves as our, the unique individuals that we are and to basically set our own standards for what is, is reasonable and what is expected and what is necessary for us to grow and to get out of this hole, get out, get out from the bottom of the good, of the good list and the top of the bad list. Uh, absolutely. I, I, mean, I, the day, I think I had to uh, back it. Get, we're, <laughs> we're at the bottom of the good lists and the top of the bad lists, and we need yeah. to not be there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's a worthwhile question. I completely agree that the barometer of oneself should not be based on 
uh, comparison with others. Having said that, to tie back to Alfred's question, you know, what can we do in journalism, in other industries, to uh, break these stereotypes or discourse that we've gotten stuck in? Both members of the black community, the American community, the international community. Uh, so that was why I kind of um, yeah. made that connection. We, we, we have got to be aware of, of the power of images to do good and to do bad. And then we gotta fight like hell and speak up when we see injustices through through propaganda. When we see it, we need to call it out for what it is, and while we're calling out the bad stuff, we need to be creating the good stuff. And fighting to get that through. It it is it is a battle. But we we've got to not let stuff go. When we see it, call it. Thank you. Uh, okay, so up next we have Lucas Lambo, who's going to, who's got a question. Where, where you go? There you go. There you are. All right. Um, hi, Ian. So uh, this actually, hi, uh, this actually kind of goes along with um, Maya's question. But first, just a little background. Actually, why uh, professor just read my question? Why I wrote that was, I'm from Chicago. I went. I'm a Protestant who went to Catholic school. Um, uh -huh. Roosevelt and Blue Island, so in a oh, yeah. neighborhood that's mm -hmm. predominantly black. Um, and I saw complete division between usually where I was actually the minority on the bus um, and obviously a neighborhood members who weren't going to this Catholic school every day on the CTA around there. And in my school, I would often learn in um, you know religion class, right, a social justice-oriented teacher, talk about issues like crime in black neighborhoods and how it's terrible and how we were lucky, how we rec we should recognize our privilege and that there are these huge problems that are literally going on in the blocks around us. And I understand what you're saying about, um, you know, generating, generating more of that power within, within the black community, but how can we as, I mean, you can take Chicago as a case study being so incredibly socioeconomically divided, how can we along all races have a more positive discourse together, whether it's through media or just general social action? Well, I'm going to ask you a provocative question, perhaps. Maybe it's provocative. You know, it, it's kind of based on the idea that we have two groups of people who are who need healing. Uh, there is the healing of white privilege and and, and the black lack of, of privilege. So the, the question becomes, what do you do when you are an aware white person and you live in a white community? What do you do in your community to talk about the behavior of those people who are doing the wrong thing vis-a-vis -vis the black community? Um, I think that we need to have more work being done by those people who are aware in all of our communities to heal our our people first to make them ready, prepared to sit at the table together. If if, if we're not healed, we can't. You know, two two broken groups, two groups of broken people can't come together and heal each other. You get to heal yourself to, to be prepared to come to the table as a as a uh, uh, balanced, uh, clear-thinking uh, human being, untraumatized, to sit down and talk about so solving problems between the two groups. So that it's a it's a it's a tough and perhaps controversial point, but I think that that black people have a problem that is unique based on the very unique circumstances under which they live and how they came here. White people have a unique set of circumstances and issues to deal with as it relates to white privilege. What I find that, that doesn't happen often enough is that the white people who are aware and sensitive and want to do well, they turn their attention to the black community as opposed to turning the attention to the white community to solve the problems that exist there, as it relate that 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 come from from the the myth of white privilege. 
So that that's 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 a, a part of my, of my thinking that perhaps uh, one may not agree with. Oh, thank you. Enlightening. Thank you. Uh, I think we have one question in the back from Jay Min. <laughs> And then it's on his way up. Uh, are there okay. any other questions? This might be our last one, and then I'll, I'll ask one. Oh, you got one? Okay, we got two more questions. So uh, this is Jamin. Yeah, there you, there you uh, go. So my question goes back to the point when you talked about your Coke while producing the Coca-Cola ad. So I believe mm -hmm. you first said that uh, people refused the commercial be because they were afraid of losing the white customers. Mm -hmm. uh, they decided to air the commercial after you came. So I wonder what strategy you used to change their decision or like like to go against their stereotypical image. Yeah, well, he, he, here's, here's, one th here's one thing I understood. I understood that, that much of American culture is driven by black culture. especially in the area of entertainment. I also understand that even those people who claim to be anti-black are intrigued with aspects of black culture. So what we, what we do is we do a two-tiered kind of, of communications approach. When you talk to the black community, you're talking to the, to the black community about things with which they are familiar, which is a part of their lives, and they are so happy to see that reflected because they never see it. Historically, they, they didn't see themselves positively, positively reflected in the media. For well, the, white, the, the white viewer, who is interested and curious about what goes on in the black community, but because of segregation, because of fear, they don't get close enough to really see it. So when you show it to them, they are intrigued with it, and they are interested in it, and then sometimes they're entertained by it. So you kind of working at two levels. I don't know if, if you if you read Mark Twain, you see the same thing happening, where Mark Twain can be talking to both an adult audience and a children's audience all at the same time. As a matter of fact, Walt Disney also does that in his, his movies, which is why you, you see parents bringing kids to Disney movies because there are things that are over the kids' heads that the parents get, but the kids are getting the adventure story. So in our case, the white audience was getting the adventure story and the black audience was getting this keen insight into uh, their, their own their own being, their own culture. So that's why it worked. And that's why it continues to work. I hope, I hope that's clear. No, that's a great response. Thank you. Uh, OK, last question is Melise, and then I'll close out with my own question as well. So uh, here's Melise. Hi. Hi, Melise. So my question was, it was from the Ugly Five chapter, and where mm -hmm. you highlighted um, some of the ugly dynamics. And I'm mm -hmm. seeing like with documentaries like Good Hair and movements like Black Girls Rock, like where do you see um, generations to come like changing with, like these perceptions that we've had of ourselves as Black women? Um, I I think it's doable bit since beauty is really uh, as, as, as subjective, mm -hmm. and I it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of examples like the young lady. Uh, who just won the uh, the Academy Award. Uh, Lupita. Uh, yeah, they brought Lupita, and we, we we basically need to do more work in that area, and we need more of our, our quote leaders taking uh, taking a uh, a leadership role and making those representations themselves. You know, the, the unfortunate thing very often is sometimes people talk about these things in the abstract but they don't walk the walk themselves. So, uh, you know, you, it, it's hard to talk about black beauty from a personal perspective if you are by your own, you know, virtually employing all of the, uh, the, uh, the 
epic of white beauty, you know. So to be proud of who we are, our skin color, and, and to highlight those things, our features, our hair, uh, to highlight those things. And uh, I think I talked in the book about uh, Chris Rock's uh, uh, wife, who's talking about a little girl and, and explaining to a little girl and, and while she herself, was, as, as the quote went, was rocking about five inches of, of weave or something, you know. So, so you, you gotta you gotta basically walk the walk, and that's what's going to change. When people are, and, the, and I talk about Ursula Burns, who's the CEO of, of Xerox, you, you know, the, the the common wisdom was that you just can't become a CEO of a major corporation with natural hair. That's mention a woman, you know. So you get, so you gotta step out there. And maybe the next time I see you, maybe you'll be, be rocking the pro. <laughs> <laughs> I'm natural, but it's protective. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so just to close, I, I've listened, I'd like to totally change subjects and um, get your opinion. So when we talked, we talked a lot about issues of identity, issues of community, and issues of media. Um, I'm particularly fascinated with the protests from yesterday uh, in Minnesota uh, at the Vikings Redskins game. And, uh, you know, the use of the term is definitely a media question. The fact that it is a brand, it is a community, as well as a racial slur. So I would just love to close with uh, your opinions on this particularly contentious topic as it relates to media and the representation of certain groups that are not visible. And what I tell my students is because genocide, right? So they have, yes. they're not visible because they cease to exist, but they're just starting to get allies and visibility with new yeah. media. So I would love for you to talk about that as kind of a case study um, and an extension of the topics you talk about with the black community in your book. Uh, absolutely. That, I, I cannot imagine any coral correlation that would be as acceptable as this scurrilous uh, 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 name uh, for a team or anything else that is supposed to be positive. I believe that if a person feels offended or a group of people feel offended by a term, then it by its very nature is offensive. A, a non-Native American owner of a team or fans of a team cannot tell me, as an African American, what's offensive to me. If it's offensive to me, then it's offensive. And I, I am all for those people who are out there appealing to the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, to ban that word from broadcast the same way they, they ban you know, words like nigga from, from, from broadcast because it is hate speech. And there is somewhere a, a law or a regulation against the use of hate speech in media that is paid for by the, by the public. It's Pacifica right? versus the FCC 1978. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, so that, I mean, that's where where I am with it. I am all, I, I, my, only, my, only, my, my way of protesting is I will not watch a, uh, a game, a Washington game. And I'm a big football fan. As soon as I see it, I, I, I turn it off. And I think we all need to do that. We need to understand that that's hurtful language. And it's made even more hurtful when people complain about it and it gets the kind of cavalier response that it gets. That makes it worse, not better. So, um, thank you. Uh, and one last question then. Where do you think media industry professionals uh, not need to stand on the issue, because everyone can choose where they stand on the issue, but uh, in your opinion, what should media professionals be doing in this situation? Whereas we talk about single boycotts um, for each consumer, what should each media industry practitioner what can they do to change not only the perception of Native Americans in media, but the perception of all stigmatized groups? 
I, th I think that in, in, the, in the course of them, they're doing their daily jobs, they need to make sure that they're not putting salt in the wounds by, by corollary kinds of activities that are equally uh, hurtful. Uh, I think we all need to become more sensitized, generally. I think that what, in addition to, to engaging in critical thinking, a lot more emphasis needs to be put on empathy, empathy, e-empathy. Uh, and, uh, and if we can empathize as journalists, as, as, as communicators, then we can do our part in changing things. I, you know, there, there are broadcasters on television who are using the term. I would not use it if I were a broadcaster. Uh, there are associates of broadcasters who use the term. I would encourage my associates who are using the term not to use the term and to speak out against the term and to stand up for it and to perhaps even lose their jobs for it, put their jobs on the line for it, saying, I am not, what would happen if the broadcaster says, we're not going to do this game. We're, we're out of here. Suppose the people behind the camera said, we're not going to do this game. We're out of here. Just, just imagine. And so if you know better, you do better. I mean, some, sometimes we don't. Know better. As soon as you know better, you do better. The thing that, that bothers me about the society overall is that we are not outraged enough and we're not vehement enough about things that bother us. We sit and we complain about things, but we don't get up and actually do something about it. Well, on, on that note, that is a perfect conclusion. Thank you so much for joining us. Can I have a round Thank of applause? You. And I will be in Chicago in two weeks, so I will give you a buzz long before then, and we'll make plans for lunch. Look forward to seeing you in person. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.